Welcome my beautiful New York City area. I'm your host Zen Sands here on FinTech TV live from the iconic New York Stock Exchange right here in downtown Manhattan. Today we're featuring Yat Tzu, co-founder and executive chairman of Animoca Brands, a global leader in blockchain games. Animoca Brands is a private company focused on digital entertainment, blockchain, gamification and artificial intelligence. They develop and publish a broad portfolio of products including the Rev and Sand Token along with original games including the Sandbox, Crazy Kings and Crazy Defense Heroes. Today Yat joins me to chat gamification, blockchain and NFTs as we head into the world of Web 3.0. Welcome to New York Stock Exchange my friend. Thank you, it's a real pleasure to be here. Absolutely, okay so let's jump right in. So, yeah, the rapid collapse of, of Silicon Valley Bank, SVP as we know, and Signature Bank, of course, has highlighted the fragility of the traditional banking sector, all while, of course, depriving crypto of its primary fiat on-ramps. And both were leading financial institutions, of course, providing banking services to crypto companies in the United States. And following the shutdowns, one would think that it would be far more challenging for crypto companies to interact with a dollar-based financial system, yet crypto is certainly paving its way as of recent market reports. Why do you think that crypto is holding strong right now amidst this banking crisis? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, you know, I think a lot of people, especially in the last year or so, have been wondering why is it that crypto is correlating with the market the way that it has? After yeah. all, it's supposed to be sort of, you know, a different thesis. Uh, and in many ways, it was because I think many people who had purchased crypto before weren't looking at it as much as a hedge, as really for speculative purposes. They were thinking, okay, we need to get into the game, we do have some exposure, but they didn't think of it as quite the hedge as they think of it right now, because a lot of people realized the weaknesses of fractional reserve banking that we're seeing currently right now. And it's also interesting that it wasn't something like Silvergate, but it was actually SVB that really caused sort of this sort of loss in trust in the banking sector. Yep. And many calls that I've been receiving is, you know, even from people who are sort of skeptical saying, so how do, I, how do I buy Bitcoin again? How do I get into Ethereum? What do I need to do? And what we're also seeing is that they're not trading it, they're actually holding it. So this has really sort of moved from a sort of hedging strategy. So I think that's, that's one, one big area that's changed as well. And the other thing is awareness. Whereas maybe three or four years ago when people were sort of more speculative in this area, yeah. they were sort of getting into it for, you know, hoping, hoping to obviously have good gains from this versus right now, they actually think of just holding, really holding it for a small percentage of the net worth and just making sure that, you know, um, that uh, that's basically something that uh, sort of is there in case the markets do what they do. And I think the other thing is that this sort of running joke a little bit in our industry, which is now sort of spreading a little bit around, which is, you know, printer is coming, right? And so, uh, you know, whether it's coming or not, it's just a matter of, well, how do we hedge ourselves against this? And it's not exactly a global currency that you can hedge yourselves against. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is the fact that everyone is now sort of looking at interest rates and, and, interest and rates. understanding how yeah. that's probably going to play out. Lots of shifts in the industry, lots of shifts. Well, Animoca Brands ranked second in the Fortune Crypto 40, and the Financial Times has recognized Animoca Brands as a high growth company in the Asia Pacific region for 2023. Now, you have also won the Deloitte Tech Fast Award. You tend to be very calculated and strategic while investing. How are you dealing with the current market downturn and how does it affect your investment decisions per se? Well, I mean, I think first of all, uh, calling this a downturn in our space is, you know, a little bit sort of interesting because if you look at sort of where crypto and pricing is right now, where Ethereum, Bitcoin is and where the market, even with the NFT industry, it's actually not as down as people might think of it. We think of the sort of real winter as 2018. I mean, that was really bad. That was right bad. now, actually, it's, uh, it's actually not too bad, but it also means less competition. So, for instance, a year ago, in sort of the height of the bull market, it wasn't just from an investing perspective that we're just looking at a lot of deals and the pace of deal making was just much faster. It was also the fact that there was a lot more competition from different investors, uh, the, comp the quality of the companies were actually sometimes harder to determine when there's so much money around because at the end of the day, when you make an investment, you also think about risk. Yeah. And so if you're able to raise 20 or $30 million for your you know, seed round fairly easily, then the risk assessment is slightly different because you've got sufficient capital to apparently run for many years versus right now, you know, seed, uh, seed found, uh, rounds are not going to be 20, 30 million. They might be single digit millions, which means that the quality of the companies, the product readiness and everything has to be much stronger in order for them to succeed in a market like this because there's also generally less venture capital around. Now, there's another sort of thing to consider as well, which is venture capital in the US for Web3 is definitely dried up in comparison to what it was before. But in Asia, for instance, it's actually not really dried up. In fact, it continues to be quite active in the investing scene. 
right in this moment in time, there's a big Web3 conference in Hong Kong, and it's absolutely booming. And you know, six or seven months ago, that region actually wasn't really promoting Web3, and now it's all into that as well. So, you know, we have to look at it from a global perspective as well. That, from an American lens, it looks you know pretty sort of negative, yeah. but from an Asian or maybe even Middle Eastern lens, yeah. actually, it's booming. It's booming. It's booming, and mass adoption is happening in every crack and every crevice. And you know, I always tell people either get on board or miss the boat because you have to either adapt with the times and roll with the punches or, and we don't say punches in a bad way, we mean roll with the tides that are changing, the markets that are evolving. And which brings us to an, another interesting point from the paradigm of where NFTs started versus where they are now. So hmm. let's chat. Let's chat NFT royalties. Some sure. say enforcing royal, royalties contradicts permissionlessness. So if you have to self, um, if you were to have self custody over an NFT and have rights to its intellectual property, does the act of forcing you to pay creator royalties go against the very idea of permissionless infrastructure? A highly debatable topic that makes a valid argument. So, for example, if you own the rights to the IP of your rare board ape and commercialize it by featuring it in an advertisement, does the original creator have the right to receive a portion of the income generated from this interaction? Many argue that for NFTs to be the key infrastructure to Web 3.0, creator royalties need to be optional as forcing holders to pay contradicts the whole idea of permissionlessness. So what is your view on zero royalties for NFT creators? So first we think zero royalties is a really bad idea because you need a sort of, you need basically a sustainable revenue base yeah. in order to maintain the ecosystem. And the way we look at it is a little bit like royalties to the NFT space is a lot like gas to Ethereum. Because imagine what happens when Ethereum, you know, everyone talks about low gas fees or no gas fees, but then how does the network actually sustain itself and how does it actually work? And then you go back into centralized systems, as we have seen in Web2, that doesn't really work. And what also happens is that really when you think about royalties, the other thing to look at it is that it's distribution of wealth. And distribution of wealth is basically distribution of power. Decentralization isn't just about sort of, you know, this sort of fragmenting the vote. Right. Decentralization is... Yeah, sort of fragmenting the power bases and giving people the appropriate governance around that. Yeah. So if, for instance, artists and creators around the world have a distributed sort of power influence yeah. on this one, then they have a way in which they have a true say in it versus, for instance, centralizing everything towards something, say, like Spotify. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that I find really funny is that, you know, many of the traders, who are the main ones who sort of criticize this, actually say, you know, well, we're creating the market, we're creating the value, why should we have to pay for that? Yeah. But in reality, if it wasn't for the royalties, then that market would have never existed. Exactly. People forget that people who bought Bored Apes, for instance, you know, some, you know, like two years ago or something, they paid a couple hundred dollars for it. And if it wasn't for royalties, the value accrual for Bored Apes would never have been would possible. Never. And instead what would have happened is, is that in order for them to create that business, they'd have to do what happens in you know, the traditional world. They'd have to actually price it forward. Right? In other words, okay, in order to make Bored Ape the ecosystem that it is, we have to charge not $200, we have to charge $100,000, $50,000 for these assets in order for a participatory network effect to begin, which means it becomes exclusive. Yeah. So what Bored Apes and Cool Cats and things like Mochaverse have done is through a very low enterprise, price, have essentially created co-participatory environments in which stakeholders can actually participate in the growth of the network sustained through royalties. Yeah. I also think it's contradictory amongst you know, those sort of libertarian people who basically say, well, it needs to be fully permissionless, we need to have all the rights attached to it. But the thing about liberty is that you can enjoy all the liberties that you want as long as you don't impinge on the liberties of others. Of others. Right? And that's exactly what they're doing. If you're a creator and you say, hey, I need you to pay me 5 or 10% royalties, yeah. your choice as a trader is to say, I don't like it. Free market says, don't buy it. Right? Not take it. Right? and do whatever you want with it. Yeah. That is, that is an, a sort of impingement on your rights. And I think, you know, when you think of it from that perspective, from our lens, actually it makes total sense. Now, just some numbers. Last year, NFT sales was $24 billion in what is apparently a bear market, right? And 90% of that value went to creators and to owners, right? The creators made single digit billions, but the owners basically made the bulk of that, yeah. right? That is a very, very fair distribution, if you think about it. In contrast, something like Spotify, which is a centralized environment, they paid seven billion dollars. Was it? You know, it's a lot of money. Yeah. But you know, they are servicing three to four hundred million listeners, millions of artists, and they can only deliver that number of royalties vis-a-vis -vis the NFT space, which is much smaller, and distributing value much more fairly and distributed. I actually think it's a fair trade. I think there's nothing wrong with you know the creator receiving 
90% of, of the value, as the owner of creating 90% of the value, sharing 5% to you know the original creator and, yeah. you know a couple single digit percentage of the platform well, I couldn't agree more I echo the sentiment in fact in the recent months of in 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 the recent months of bearish global market conditions coupled with the zero royalty narrative that we've just been talking about many NFT projects have faced unfavorable consequences yet yeah, to your point and as more and more marketplaces enable traders to easily bypass creator royalties project owners are financially incentivized to either increase to your point their initial mint prices to generate more revenue Revenue in the beginning or mint more of the collection supply to the project's treasury to sell over time. Which dilutes so, the value which overall. Which dilutes the value. So I totally believe, and I echo your sentiment, that eliminating creator royalties fundamentally harms the sustainability and growth of the NFT creator economy without a doubt. So right. there you go on that one. Now, Animoca's mission has always been mass adoption of Web 3.0. And reaching mass adoption will ultimately come down to the benefits that Web 3 applications can provide, such as self-custody and the ownership of digital collectibles. Do you see a big Web 3.0 mass adoption happening within the next two years? Absolutely. So first of all, we have been focused earlier a lot on gaming. Many of the high quality games that we've invested in and supported and, and been building are starting to come out basically in the next, uh, actually this and next year. Yeah. Um, and that's of course not just us. In our over 400 investments that we have today, 130 to 140 of them are all games related. And you know, a number of them are obviously, you know, hopefully going to do pretty yeah. well. But even then, what, what you're seeing in places like Asia, many of the large game companies out there are actually doing that as well. Yeah. Where they're sort of, you know, like Square Enix, for instance, or Krafton, you know, creators of PUBG, for instance, they're actually also making Web3 games. So what's, hap what's going to happen is, is that a flurry of very high quality games are going to enter the space. And the same happened in mobile back in 2011, 2012, when sort of mobile startups started coming up and saying, hey, this is a real opp good opportunity. But it took a couple of years to get the high quality mobile games to come out because games take some time to make and then essentially bring on mass adoption that way. But the other area that we're really excited about is education. And what we're seeing, for instance, things like with TinyTap, well, the sort of financial inclusion that happens and the capital formation that happens with what you could say are sort of technically been low, sort of low, low value assets yeah. because they generate maybe single digit dollars or maybe tens of dollars. But actually now with NFTs, by owning an NFT, you own the rights yeah. to you know, basically that asset that might be only making you 10 or $20 a year. But now, through the ownership of the NFT sale, you might be willing to pay 50 or $100 for it. So this capital formation benefit yeah. then basically just grows that ecosystem. So even you know, things that are only worth sort of 5 or $10, like gaming items for instance, can now be worth 50 or 100 or $200 because you have the benefit of the capital formation, which is true for anything uh, and any kind of content class. You couldn't do that before because if, you wanted to, if I wanted to sell you something with contractual rights, I'd have to hire a lawyer, I yeah. need paperwork, I need a contract. It's not worth selling you anything at least it means that makes at least a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, exactly. for instance. And now you can do this. Um, and to me, this is not just opening up what we're seeing in places like the US, uh, which you know, time and time teachers benefit from, but also developing countries where you know banking system infrastructure simply can't bank people that are making one or two or three dollars a month. No, it's right. impossible. Yeah. And it's interesting because now that we have the rise of the creator economy and we have 1.7 billion people in this world that are unbanked and or underbanked. Absolutely. What we're seeing here is a paradigm shift because they all have a smartphone and with a smartphone they can all trade. They can trade cryptocurrency, they can take their cryptocurrency and trade it into fiat currency and for some of these gamers five and ten dollars a day yeah. that feeds a family, yeah. right? Yes. And so this is truly paving, this is the pathway out of poverty in many right. respects. Yeah. The rise of the creator economy and when you see um, when you see the good that's coming out of this and, and mass adoption really taking place at a groundbreaking rate because we do have rates that we're looking at statistically where we see the world hopping on board onto the blockchain, mm, getting mm. excited about all of the proprietary things that the metaverse has to offer. I mean, this is definitely, we're living in a, in a digital times, and I say there's gold in them digital hills. So yes. everything you're doing at Animoca Brands, congratulations. You guys you are so amazing leaders in your field. And thank you so much for so much insight and the edutainment that you're providing to an array of audience and, and gamers around the world. I know you guys are really, really working hard there on the edutainment side. Yes, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Guys, that was the amazing, the incredible Yatsu. Thank you for joining me here on FinTech TV, live from the New York Stock Exchange. That was Animoca Brands founder Yatsu. Check them out at animocabrands.com. I'm your host, Zen Sams, right here on FinTech TV.